thanks to everybody who's stuck around for the last uh, panel of the day. Uh, we are all very excited for this. It's a, it's a super interesting topic. It's a very relevant topic. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I think there are lots of nuances to discuss here when we talk about disruptions in the doing good model. Um, I come from the private sector. I've spent uh, over a decade in, in the private sector uh, helping technology companies with their strategies. Uh, and words like uh, disruption, uh, innovation, transformation are used quite commonly in the private sector. Uh, but I have been in the uh, social impact space for the last uh, six, seven years, and I have learned that um, you know we we need to use these words a little carefully when we talk when we when we look at uh, social impact, and and the reason for that is that we are we're really dealing with very complex issues. So the discussions around disruption need to be very nuanced. Um, and I say that uh, when I talk about complexity, uh, I mean complexity in the problems that we're trying to solve. Uh, even in the panel today, uh, we have people who are dealing with mental health issues um, uh, and, and health issues. We, we have people working on innovative finance, et cetera. Uh, we, we all in the social impact space work on very complex problems and there are no templatized solutions to solve these problems. So you need to come up with new ways of prob problem solving. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a huge need for financing in the social impact space, uh, but you can't be using um, private sector financing mechanisms to, to fund uh, social impact problems, so you need to think about innovation uh, in, in problem solving. Um, you also have the, the issue of collaboration. Uh, people work, people organizations uh, work with a lot of passion and motivation in the social impact space. Um, but there is a lack of collaboration. There is need for more collaboration, and, and that lends itself to more uh, innovative models of collaboration, thinking about how do you uh, come up with common incentives. And finally, when we talk about disruption, we have to think about technology. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's a common mistake to apply technology that has worked in urban settings, private, set, private sector settings, into, into social impact setting, where we're really talking about uh, deep uh, social cultural issues. So how do you customize technologies? So when we talk about disruption today in the doing good models, we'll hopefully try and cover these complexities. Um, but while there are complexities over the last decade or so, uh, there have been some very, very good examples of, of innovation and disruption in the social impact space. And I'm delighted that uh, a lot of my um, uh, panelists over here are, have been at the forefront, their organizations have been at the forefront of these uh, disruptions, whether it's in um, looking at new ways of uh, financing, whether it's thinking about um, applying technology, uh, whether it's about innovative finance and, and working with communities. So that being said, um, I am very excited uh, to moderate this panel. Uh, we've got six panelists and about 50 minutes uh, to discuss this because uh, we would like to hear from you and, and hear your questions as well. So we'll probably keep five, seven minutes for Q&A. Um, but I'll, I'll jump straight in, um, and, and for the benefit of the audience, because like I mentioned, uh, disruptions is something that is a fairly complicated topic and we need to be very careful in the way we use this, uh, I'd, I'd like to start with uh, just asking the panelists about uh, you know, the big challenges that they have seen uh, in the, in the non-profit or the social sector, uh, where they think uh, there is a need to rethink the way in which we work. Or if I had to ask the same question in another way, which are the roadblocks or challenges which, which lend itself to more disruptions in the way we work? Um, and and uh, just a request to the panelists to keep your answers to about two minutes, uh, two to three minutes, and then we'll, after that, look at uh, specific initiatives and examples where we've seen disruption and the kind of impact so that you know, we can all learn from each other. But let's start with the challenges. So um, I'll, in no order, but maybe we'll just start from there. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Kunal. Um, yeah, the challenges um, are multiple, um, and I know a lot of us will focus you know, on different aspects um, and, and they span through sort of access to funding, kinds of funding sources, diversifying some of those, um, looking at uh, improving governance, um, acquiring talent, uh, upskilling talent, 
Um, I particularly focus on capacity building at data.org. We are a nonprofit uh, that looks at uh, building the uh, platform for partnerships on really building the field of data science for social impact. Um, at data.org, we are on a mission to have one million purpose-driven data professionals in the social impact space in the next 10 years. And so from that perspective, thinking about talent, I feel like some of the challenges uh, which are then the opportunities for us to be thinking about is how do we have talent that is um, not focused on just one aspect. So we have talent that understands interdisciplinarity that is sort of T-shaped talent and that's really able to figure out the multifold issues that exist in today's um, uh, social impact sector. Um, so we're looking at the T-shaped uh, leaders that are needed for the sec sector, which are people who understand a broad base of issues and then they are experts or specialists in some of these aspects. So looking at specialist generalists is what um, I feel is like one big uh, challenge for today. Uh, thanks, Priyank. I think the, uh, you said looking for specialized talent. I think just ch talent is a problem, just finding the right kind of human resources with the right passion and commitment to the sector itself is a big challenge and you know I think we need to solve for it. Um, and then as organizations grow, I think capacity build, management capacity building of the organizations, many times NGOs are set up as a single individual founder-led organizations, but then as they grow, they face um, management challenges. How do you manage teams? How do you create organization structures that are uh, efficient? How do you think about legal structures, et cetera, as you grow? So how do you uh, ensure that the right management skill sets are then at the right time provided to the organization that enables them to grow further? And that's actually some of the work that we do at the Center for Social Impact at McKinsey as well. Um. Thanks, Kunal. So, and just just building off on uh, what the other panelists have said, uh, I think capacity building is is definitely a, a recurring theme. And for us, specifically around helping organizations move towards measuring and tracking and using outcome data rather than measuring outputs, right? And I think that's that's a significant challenge in the sector because you've got a lot of effort going into tracking outputs, right? Uh, and you'll have donors saying, well, you've, you've, you've said that you'll uh, deliver the X number of trainings, so give me a, a report every two months saying that you've done this. And so your effort and your attention isn't going into tracking outcomes. You're not looking at, am I measuring the right metrics to enable me to know whether I'm, whether I'm making change or not? So that awareness, that orientation, and I think the lack of capacity as well within the, within the sector to measure it effectively. And then of course, the, the perennial problem that no funding is available for this uh, because everybody wants all funding in programs to go all of it towards only program delivery, but not capacity. Yeah. And Karan, if I, if I may just probe that a little bit, why has it been uh, difficult to, uh, move this um, narrative towards outcome-based funding or adoption of outcome-based funding? Why has it been so difficult? So I think, look, our outcomes are messy, they're long-term, they take patience. So for fun from funder perspectives, especially when you look at something like CSR funding, when you typically might have one-year cycles or two-year cycles, you want to see organizations coming back to you with big numbers. Okay, we've, we've done X number of things. We've built so many schools. But if you say to someone that, look, it's going to take me five years to change the needle on something like keeping uh, children safe, right? Then that's for funders. You have to go through a journey to get there. And, and I'm purposely saying for funders because you don't want to put all the onus just on, on organizations and say, you have to be better because funders have to get there as well and recognize that they need to push the envelope and for organizations they need to invest resources into that capacity and have that orientation as well okay thanks for that raj so um you know i think to answer this i'm going to get into a little bit of history and i'm speaking now as uh, representing a funding organization the bar for us is set very high because in the history of modern India, there was a disruption when 
the freedom struggle was funded by philanthropy and by business people. So that's my pain point. Where has this appetite for social change gone? Why is there a disproportionate focus on short-term investment, short-term outcome, short-term program goals? Why is there a focus on expertise that is likely to be copy-pasted from the West? Um, and so I think the bar has been set very high for us in terms of disruption, because in the history of modern India, it was disruptive to fund our freedom struggle. So uh, where is that taste for revolution now? Uh, that's missing. Am I to assume I'm going next? Yes. yes. Well, that was brilliantly put. I think uh, the, the lack of risk appetite uh, for long-term systemic change, bottom-up, is missing. And uh, Raintree Foundation works on what we call as the Sustainable Landscape Management Program. Our, our tagline is Dignity for Planet and People. We are a planet-focused organization. Our, our planet is four billion years old three-year cycles is not going to cut it for us. And, and um, what we do is, what we are hoping to establish in a very long period of 10, 15 years, is community custodianship of their landscape. Uh, we work in the Northern Western Ghats, which is a global biodiversity hotspot, and it comes with its own set of geographical weather data. For example, the quantity of aquifer, the you know, hydrogeological data, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that our disruption starts there because we are working on a 360 degree approach for community and its immediate environment. Our baseline itself was disruptive. We talked to 10 expert agencies to put in a cross-cutting baseline which would take care of everything from environmental aspects to water availability to livelihoods, all the way up to gender, disability, and mental health. Um, so it started with the very data that we are creating. We are working on collecting data intensively. Our program is led by the data that we collect because it's a, it's a landscape approach, which means everything in that landscape and the data relevant to that landscape will dictate what model we make for that particular geography. Very participative as well, because the community is going to be the eventual custodian, which means a lot of work with the community. We are building local institutions, strengthening Gram Panchayati institutions, SHGs, farmer groups, the whole works, right? Uh, so the dis disruption starts with the kind of data we collect and the kind of um, uh, connect we build with the community. Then it goes on to funding mechanisms. Right now we are running a pilot, but when we scale beyond this particular geography, we will be covering large expanses of a territory defined by natural boundaries. And that will need very patient funding. It will need innovative financing because uh, climate funding needs a long-term horizon. So we are looking at 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, and then possibly looking at bonds, blended finance models, uh, needs risk capital. Um, I think the third uh, problem uh, or roadblock that we have had is in terms of capacity, uh, in terms of internal teams, and external partners because we work on 15 out of 17 SDGs already. And potentially in our scale up, possibly working on all 17 SDGs. Uh, it means that we can't work in silos. It's very nature of our program means that we need to work with experts in the sector. It means that every thematic needs to learn to consider every other thematic because we don't intended consequences to be good for the overall program, but we want unintended consequences to be none for other programs, right? And, and therefore, it means it needs a stretch in our internal teams. It needs a stretch in our partner teams. Our design process becomes very complicated because we are asking each program to tackle five, six, seven, eight SDGs at the same time. Everything we can do in a particular program, we will try and do it, cutting across silos. That comes, uh, then the m &E framework becomes a challenge because we don't have an m &E framework which is integrated in this manner. Um, so there are a bunch of challenges for a program like ours. Uh, and I think most of all is risk-taking ability in our internal teams and the sector at large. Because uh, for climate action, you need to think big, you need to think long, you need to go right to the bottom of things, uh, you need to be patient, 
And these are some of the things which are not currently built into our systems. And so um, with, with a program like ours, I think everybody we work with stretches and breaks some of those boundaries that currently exist. And we're hoping uh, along the way we will be able to stretch these uh, for, for India and, and take it beyond India as well at some point of time. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Lena. I think we'll, we'll definitely want to get more into what are the examples in which some of the challenges have been addressed because you're working at, at a very important intersection of community and environmental sustainability. Sumit? Hi, uh, I'm Sumit and I work at uh, Give. Uh, so Give is a, is a fundraising platform, right? We work with 3,000 NGOs right now, uh, working with donors to facilitate money to flow to NGOs, in simple words, right? That's what we do. So when I'm thinking challenges, the part of this ecosystem that I think I understand a little better is around funding. And those are the challenges that I think I would want to highlight. Uh, I think in a simple, single word, the challenge is scale. The problems we are dealing with and trying to solve are very, very large. Uh, the people who are solving them for a range of reasons are working in small organizations that don't scale as quickly and as well as they could in, let's say, the private sector environment. Not to say which one is better, but that is the challenge. How do you scale an organization when you have to spend all your reserves practically in the same year, when all your sources of funding happen on an annual cycle in most cases, come with restrictions that in private sector language effectively restrict your EBITDA to 10%. So try scaling an organization with under single-digit EBITAs, no equity, no debt, uh, single-year capital, and try and address the largest problem out there under those constraints, right? That's a challenge. But the flip side of this is the most common question that keeps getting asked is, you know, do you know a way to work around the FCRA, <laughs> right? And the answer which we have known for a while is no. There isn't and there won't be. Every country has laws. You can debate the laws or you can, you know, argue against laws and that's fine. But when we're talking about challenges and disruptions and innovations, every industry also around the world finds a way to work with the law and with the regulatory structure and with the funding structure and with the entire ecosystem to find a way to work with it. And I think that's the part that I would want to talk about later on how we could do that here. Because without funding coming in at scale and coming in a way that it can be used long term, uh, it's very hard to move forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Sumit. So hopefully that, that has given everybody uh, an idea of the complexities that we're dealing with. It wasn't a secret, but I think we've heard very clearly that we're dealing with uh, complexities in terms of the capacity building challenges, the level of professionalism that exists in this sector, um, how we need to start uh, addressing the challenges around uh, funding and, and move towards outcome-based models and, and uh, 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 data collection challenges uh, around that. And, and there are also challenges around um, just an approach of, uh, of taking a, a longer-term systemic, systemic view to, to the problems that we're, that we're solving. And, and uh, not to add to the list of worries, we, we're talking about the changing um, external environment, FCRA, and, and those type of things. So let's now take these challenges and, and start looking at uh, some examples of how they've been addressed. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll start with you, uh, because you, you spoke about um, financing, you talk about outcome-based funding. Uh, I, I know that BAT has been quite involved, at the, they've been, you've been at the forefront of uh, impact bonds. Uh, can you talk a little more about uh, the rationale for impact bonds uh, and also the results of one of the impact bonds have been recently released and, and what have you observed there? Uh, what are the learnings from there? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so, so we've been working with impact bonds for about four or five years now and um, I mean, impact bonds are essentially one way of doing pay-for-results models where 
you're linking uh, payments to the achievement of outcomes. Not outputs, but, but outcomes. So what are the long-term sort of deep-rooted change that you're trying to achieve? And the rationale really, I think, is uh, can, can we move funding, can we, can we provide funding in a way that it's focusing on creating change and on facilitating real outcomes rather than tying organizations up in inflexible types of funding which focus on short-term measures, focuses on tracking outputs, and that really helps them give the flexibility and the capacity they need to create long-term change. So uh, uh, one example I can talk about is uh, we had uh, a bond, a development impact bond called the Quality Education India Development Impact Bond, focusing on uh, how do you uh, create uh, transformative sort of education models? How do you improve quality of learning for primary school children? And that, it, it just wrapped up its sort of four-year uh, life uh, a couple of months ago, and the results have been, have been quite, quite good. Despite the challenges of COVID, what we saw was that um, our schools that went through the different programs focusing uh, that, that were part of the DIB, uh, children there on average learned 2.5 times better than, than children in schools which were not part of those, uh, of those uh, interventions. So we had four different partners with four different models implementing in, in different states, but all four of them were being tracked on exactly the same metrics, which were just improvements in numeracy and improvements in literacy. And I think what was different here was, one, the funding was provided flexibly, so they weren't, it wasn't tied to specific outputs. They were free to change their models of delivery, the way that they were delivering certain things, basis what they thought working on the ground was important. So they were very free to change, change up the way they worked. Uh, this created, because of the intense focus on results, it created a results-based culture where the entire organization oriented itself to saying what's most important is achieving those outcomes. And therefore, resources and capacity was, was accordingly driven towards making sure that results were being monitored and tracked. We had uh, performance management, actually, with, with Dalberg playing the role of performance manager and providing hands-on support to the partners over the four years, and so helping them with challenges on the ground on an ongoing basis. So that capacity building element was important, and where it came together, therefore, was in a very data-driven culture where ongoing, you would, you would have measurement of the right metrics, you'd get that data and use it on an ongoing basis to improve performance, to change things, to make sure that you were orienting yourself to, to deliver the best possible results. And I think what, what that's helped us do is, is really see which models have been able to work where, and where we've seen success. And we've been able to be very nimble thanks to this as well. Well, that's great. That's a, that's a really good example of, of uh, uh, you know, different stakeholders coming together, uh, almost, almost a collaborative approach. Uh, and identifying specific roles for different stakeholders uh, to be able to make this impact bond successful. And you're saying you're seeing some clear success stories over there. Uh, the obvious question, I'm sure you get that a lot of, is uh, you've seen success of this in education, in, in specific types of models, four types of models. How do you scale this? Uh, are there uh, s applications in other sectors? Uh, or, or rather, how do you even think about scaling this? Yeah, thank you. So I think what's important to sort of recognize is that impact bonds are another mechanism of trying to demonstrate, you know, if, if a model works or not. They're not a tool for organizations to get more and more and more funding and grow that way. You come into an impact bond if there is a clear proposition, if there is a clear problem statement that we're trying to solve, and where it's very important to recognize that there are that the metrics, that the problem can be clearly quantified. You can have clear measurement sort of metrics around that. Uh, it perhaps will not work in every situation, especially situations which are messy and complicated, where you don't have clear metrics for being able to measure outcomes. Um, and once you've sort of gone through an impact bond, you've seen that something is successful, then I think it's about sort of successful, then, then it's about taking that to the right sort of uh, 
to the right partners, to maybe the government and saying, we've seen evidence of this working, you know, is this something that we can work with you on? Uh, but, but it's not meant to be a tool in, in perpetuity. Thanks, thanks so much, Karl. So, but I'll go back to you now and, and, and just, uh, because we had a discussion around uh, different ways of financing, uh, and, and you spoke about finding ways to bring in scalable money. Uh, can you talk about the work of Given and how uh, examples that you might have seen of that uh, working? Sure. Uh, so I think uh, it really comes down to a question of uh, every money has a flavor, right? Depending on who the donor is, you will have a certain ability to use that money for X time. If it's a CSR donor, it has to follow an annual cycle. If it's an HNI donor, it can be a 10 year journey. Right? If it's a retail donor, it needs some level of instant reporting. It needs the ability to go back quickly and engage again. So every kind of donor has a flavor to it. The needs on the ground are also in various different shapes and sizes. The ability to match the two is where the story begins. Right? And I'll take the example of the COVID work that GIF did last year. We're talking about around $100 million being deployed across eight months where that money included foreign capital, Indian capital, corporates, employees, retail givers, just somebody clicking on a button and donating 100 rupees or 10,000 rupees or whatever, right? HNIs, it included all of this, brands who were not giving CSR money, who were associating their brand with a cause or collecting donations from their customers, right, for a cause. All of these are very distinct flavors of money. And what you can do with CSR money, you cannot do with, let's say, retail money. Right? So it's a matching, it's a concept that you know, most nonprofits are fairly familiar with and deal with on a regular basis. But matching those two and being open to therefore raise more than one kind of money if you want to run a 10-year journey is absolutely critical. If you have one source of funding, then it's not going to sustain. It's going to be just too restrictive. The second angle of this is, I think, as a, as a fundamental requirement now, if we are looking at scale, we will have to look at collaborating with for-profit players far more deeply. Because given the environment, grant capital will never be enough. And you cannot access equity or debt uh, in a pure non-profit environment. So whether it is having the ability to raise both kinds of money by using both kinds of entities or finding partners in the for-profit world who can do one part while non-profits are doing the other. And again, raising both kinds of money is, uh, in my view, an absolute necessity. Um, today, if you want to raise a thousand crores for anything for social impact for India, you have no choice but to do all of this. Uh, there is no single organization that can absorb that kind of money. While 1,000 crores is no more a small number, it's no more a large number for fundraising for any startup. There are hundreds who have done it. Right? So that gap is a very real gap and the reasons for that is, I think even within the social impact space, we'll just have to open up to these ideas uh, without which scale is not going to be possible. Impact bonds were supposed to be impossible to do at one point of time. The QEI results now have been really nice. I never understood any of it till I started reading it and then I figured how good it is. Um, no one thought it's possible and then Educate Girl goes out, uh, Girls goes out and raises a ton of money using a dip. Right? So it just takes one person to do it. It is highly feasible. It takes overhead, it takes pain. No fundraising is ever easy. But I think as a, fundamentally as a sector, um, one crore and two crores will only get us so far. And 10-year problems are not going to get solved purely by grant capital. If, if I had one message for you know, the entire challenge, it would be you have to have different types of capital and different types of donor. So, yeah. And uh, um, I think uh, uh, this, uh, ability to match different sources of funding uh, based on the needs is it makes a lot of sense 
if if i am an organization looking to raise money how do i even approach that because i'm not uh, i'm an ngo working in in a small village i need to raise a certain amount of money uh, how do you think about building awareness of such organizations to be able to tap certain uh, these sources of, of of funding no easy answers uh, no silver bullet to it it is a hard grind but it is a hard grind for everybody in the world to raise money for anything right sales was never easy and fundraising is a sales job uh, but here are some suggestions right if you are a very csr heavy organization then you really need to start looking at retail fundraising there are enough platforms out there that do that and there are enough ngos out there that do it and do it extremely well right there are superstars in that world if it's csr fundraising then you have to, i mean the only way to do it today is really one on one there are no organized platforms in retail you have organized platforms in um, csr you don't so you have to go out and do one on one connects be it your hni network be it your existing donors they will have to open the doors there is no way around that right as far as i know that's really the only way to do it uh actively investing on platforms that are global is probably the only other suggestion i would leave you with the benefits of the world right there are they cost nothing your cause benefits there are so many of them but they are present in organizations across the world they get you the visibility that you will not be able to get sitting out of india they are all fcra compliant they enable foreign fundraising for indian ngos that do have fcra uh, so it's not that tools don't exist there are foundations there are folks like bat who are doing very good work in specific areas um, it it will take investment there is no shortcut to it um, but it's not like it's impossible to start or it's not like the starting point is not known uh, some part of the 10% needs to go there <laughs> thanks thanks so much sumit um i'll move away from funding to uh, talking about more community based innovative approaches raj maybe i'll start with you uh M MHI works on on very important issues of mental health, uh, which which essentially means that uh, you need to work a lot at the community level. Uh, you need to work a lot with different types of organizations, NGOs, CSOs, uh, think tanks, governments, etc., uh, and, and others. I'm sure, which leads to a lot of complexity. Uh, so, a question is: What does the word disruption even mean in this context? And what are some of the examples in which you've seen innovation and disruption from your work? so i think um, you know drawing on what some of the folks on the panel have said um i think in this context disruption could mean um looking beyond the expert right do we need urban savvy elite educated people do we need psychiatrists now if i set up a psychiatrist booth out here how many people would visit it let me tell you not that many um and so one of the answers at least that mental health tends to give you is you have to look at communities and people as experts in their own context now i'll i'll share one example it's a program that we partner on that runs in 580 villages in one district in gujarat district is 600 villages about 8000 people each who live in these villages have been given a certain level of training to provide basic mental health support to their fellow villagers they in turn uplink to someone who has a little more training but is still part of that region knows what is going on in the region knows the pain points of that region knows why maybe farmers are suffering or knows why certain industries are failing and then finally that interlinks to government services so now we have a psychiatrist who by law is supposed to sit in the district hospital who is sitting in the district hospital rare but it's happening why because there is a push from the supply side people know that there's a psychiatrist sitting there so if i am to look at issues of capacity of expertise some of the things that mental health can teach us is that the answer does really lie in building strong communities and then linking it further to all types of inclusion i've heard the word um, scale 
a lot today. And I'm going to say, you actually don't ever talk about scale without talking about inclusion and intersectionality, which means that it's not enough for me to provide counseling. I have to be able to say, okay, you had a mental health issue. What happened to your livelihood? What happened to your home? Were you able to get a ration card? And in many cases, the answer is no. So I have to be able to put these services in. It's not enough for us to know what the problems are, or it's not enough for us to look at the solutions to the problems. We need to look at how and why the problems are being distributed in the way that they are. And so if we look at scaling, inclusion is a must, intersectionality is a must. And the answer to that, honestly, and to the capacity building issues, is a community mental health program like this. Like I said, 8,000 people have been trained, and I'm very bad at the numbers. Okay, here we go. 800 people have been trained to give at least five sessions from these villages. 2,400 people also from the villages at a slightly lower level. And um, all it takes is then two urban elite corporate-ish type of project managers, right? Um, 37,250 people received help for common mental health issues in these 600 villages just in two years. So that's, that's a big number. And when you read next about mental health, you'll hear, first thing you'll hear is India doesn't have enough psychiatrists. There are 80% of India's population that will never access a psychiatrist. Great disruption. Most of them may not need a psychiatrist. Um, so we need to look at our context. We need to challenge the idea of who's the expert. And we need to build in equality if we are to get to scale, because systems born of inequality will not bring about change. Thanks a lot. And, and uh, we, uh, you know, you said that it's been two years of uh, this program, and you're already seeing some, some interesting results. But I'm sure there are lots of different learnings also. Uh, if I can ask how your approach has changed from the time that you started versus, versus now. You mentioned a little bit about the need for inclusivity, intersectionality, and uh, all of those things, and, and that's obviously a learning over time, but uh, what are the other learnings in which approaches have changed over time? Um, so I'll use another example. Uh, another program that we work with, this time in Maharashtra, works only with farming communities in Usmanabad. And it's run by someone from a farming family himself. Um, and he put in place a mental health support because as you know, farmers are really affected by climate change. And this is what I meant when I said, let's look at the distribution of how, why are the problems being distributed like this, right? And we have to answer those questions. But anyway, he set this up. Um, and again, he had, he used to go door to door giving pamphlets, he set up a telephone line. Why it worked was because he knew what the issues were. He knew how to talk to farmers, he knew how to talk to their families. He's made a massive change in farmer suicides in his region, massive. Um, part of the learning that we had there was that we linked up directly to a psychiatrist and that actually did not work. What ended up happening was a far more interesting thing where young people who are going to agricultural colleges in that district started becoming volunteers and now they go house to house. So just an example, a child in a house met one of these young students who was going house to house and he called the helpline a few days later and said, I think my father is going to do something because I heard him talking like this and you referenced it. And that's how the father got help. Similarly, completely different um, policy example, if I'm to give it, because not everything needs to be that complicated. Pesticides are one of the ways that people do try to die by suicide in India. And in Tamil Nadu, there was a pilot program where they said, we are going to store pesticides in a community managed storage facility. That in itself, managed to more than half suicide rates. So again, in Tamil Nadu, allowing kids in ninth and 10th standard to redo their exam if they failed, massive, massive change in suicide rates. So it's very important to look at how and why the problems are being distributed in the way that they are, as well as intersections. 
Well, thanks for that. Um, good thing is that we're doing, we're doing good on time, which I was not expecting. Uh, and uh, thank you to the panelists already. So uh, hopefully we can come back to you with another round of questions because uh, Raj, I would be really interested to also ask you how these approaches can be embedded into policy, right? Uh, this is, I think, a really important question. But moving to uh, Lena, I think uh, similar to what Raj was talking about, the complexities at the community level, uh, your work is, is cutting across so many different SDGs uh, and so many different specializations. So uh, you started talking a little bit about the challenges, but what are the experiences in terms of things that have worked um, in addressing these? Things that have worked for us is um, the fact that we have persevered, I think. Uh, that has been very important because the system uh, is not designed for a program like this. Um, having said that, uh, that's not the end of it. I think uh, the community is maybe in many ways wiser than a lot of us because that is their reality. Climate change is a reality for them. Um, where we are is, is a single crop, rain-fed, paddy agriculture. Um, so when you look at average numbers of rainfall and they say average rainfall across Maharashtra, that is not their reality because come October, they have so much rain that their standing crop bed gets destroyed. And these averages really have no meaning when we come to uh, rural realities. Um, and so therefore, uh, you come to a bunch of social issues linked with the fact that the land and the climate change, the, the poor soil health, uh, monocropping, bad agricultural practices, you know, for decades together, has made the land uh, not able to support their communities uh, in, a, in a full manner, like they used to. Uh, so there are many issues. There's malnutrition. Now, in a, in a region where uh, people used to grow paddy, they used to grow ragi, they used to grow pulses, they are only growing paddy for the market. Uh, growing for self-consumption has gone completely because everything they do is geared to, con to be consumed by the city. And uh, then there is migration, there are water problems, there is, uh, you know, girl child not being able to go to school. Um, there were tankers coming in from February onwards. Uh, cattle had to be sold March onwards, sometimes in a bad year when there's no water. Dairy is one of their, um, you know, sources of income. So it cuts across um, everything, livelihoods. Of course, mental health becomes stretched because the social fabric is getting stretched. Um, one of the reasons why the family came to this program is we realized that in, in, in Bharat and not India, Everything is interlinked. You can't really put a boundary around anything. And I think what Raj said is a true example. If you're looking on mental health, you have to look at the drudgery to get water. You have to look at the drudgery of cutting, uh, getting firewood. You have to look at women's health in terms of their cooking experiences. You have to look at nutrition where they're not eating millets anymore. Uh, and, and, you know, the pulses they used to grow. You have to look at girl child. You have to look at lack of toilets. There's a bunch of issues. Where do you draw the line and say, I solve for this, but I leave the rest of the community or the rest of the environment untouched. It, it, for me and the family, it became impossible to say that. And I, I give an example. I have arthritis in different parts of my body. I have early onset of arthritis. And uh, funnily enough, I go to an orthopedic doctor, but I go to a different one for my hand and wrist and a different one for my elbow and shoulder and a third one for my knee. And at the end of it all, I may be miserable in my marriage, I may have failed in my exam, I may have got fired from a job, I may be feeling good, I may be feeling bad. My well-being has nothing to do with the fact that I went to three th separate doctors for three different joints. This is what we're doing in the development sector as well. It makes no meaning for us in the real Bharat that we all, you know, hope to represent, to make boundaries, man-made boundaries and silos and work on one aspect of a woman. We work on SRHR, we work on SHGs, we work on livelihoods, and we forget that when she goes home, her, across the landscape, there is alcoholism and, and her husband is beating her up. There, she has no voice in the village. Which part of the woman are you addressing? At the end of the day, is that woman feeling good? And the same goes for different aspects of the environment. We have fish which swim upstream to spawn. And when we rampantly build 
buns and, and you know, boundaries and we stop the water and we, we dam it and, and uh, what happens to the fish and its dignity and right to live in that landscape where we work is a global biodiversity hotspot. Northern Western Ghats are a storehouse of the world's richest diversity uh, in, in life. And here we go around only looking at the needs of the community, damming everything inside, slowing the water, stopping it, making it per percolate. Easy, right? And then where does the fish go? It disappears. We have frogs which disappear. We have fish which disappear. We have migratory birds which disappear. Um, and diversity in all our experiences is disappearing because we are making extremely human-centric decisions for the landscape. Not to say that human beings are not important, communities are not important. We can even, I, I'm, he'll give, even go so, so far as to say we are first among equals. But do we have the right to extinguish any species from, from their own natural habitat? And that's where this whole program came about. And I think uh, some of the things which have worked for us, coming back to you, is that the community understands this. There is local wisdom, the elders understand it. Unfortunately, the new generation is getting weaned away from the facts of their existence and their landscape and the diversity and the wealth that nature gave them. Um, but I think there is enough there already to start building it back. And um, that's what Raintree is working on. Uh, I think the community over a period of time has understood the intersection of all the thematics, have understood how each one is extremely essential to support the other. And you can't do one without, without the other. And nobody stands alone. No thematic stands alone. The community stand, uh, cannot survive without its environment. The environment cannot survive unless the community is its custodian. And I think that possibly has been our biggest success, that we work very, very closely with the community. All our data is mined from the community. We've done intense amount of communication, um, you know, confidence building measures. We do participatory decision making. And I think that's been a very slow process. Funders, please help us out. Some, but some patient funders would like to meet me after this, maybe, because this is a slow process. Everything we do is a mindset change. Nobody's mind changes overnight. We all know that, right? And so it's also a ladder approach. Unless we do one step, the community and the environment is not ready to take the second step. So we can't go from one to five in a three-year span. We need to do one, then we need to let it settle, then we need to do two, then we need to let it settle, and then we have to go to 20 one day. And it's a long process, and I need, what I need is a fraternity of supporters, of believers who understand that in a planet which is a billion years old, in mankind which is thousands of years old, if you want to do, I mean, all you young people are very concerned about what will be the state of the planet for you 50 years down the line? You have 50, 70 years to live. Anybody who's in their 20s, 30s, and where are you going to be? Guys, wake up. This is your time to do something about it. And uh, Raintree is hoping to prove a model for, uh, the, for the Western Ghats, because that is uh, a, a big source of all our ecosystem services for peninsular India. And, and hoping we can go from there and start doing bigger work at scale once we have a proof of concept. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lina. Um, really good insights on community-based approaches. Um, I'll, I'll move now to uh, more internal approaches at the organization level. Um, and uh, maybe I'll start with you, uh, Priyank, and then I'll move to you, Shreya. Uh, in intentionally keeping you towards the end because I think at McKenzie you have a, a, a holistic view of what's happening. Um, but Priyank, just starting from you, uh, I think two things that are happening. One is that um, more and more there is an application of technology in, in how we start looking at decision making which is very different from how the private sector looks at it but there, it's still very relevant. And, and related to that is, is the talent and the skill required to be able to do that. Uh, Data.org is working, um, you know, on those specific issues. Can you talk a little more about um, how you're addressing those and, and, and the innovation that you've seen there? Sure. Thanks, uh, Kunal. So, 
it's it's been very interesting to hear how we're thinking about scaling and IDEA or intersectionality. How we are thinking about um, the community-based wisdom uh, that exists, right? And and not sort of moving away from it. Um, the complexity of the issues today has also sort of made it uh, made made all of us take the direction where technology is sort of that enabler for us to scale. Um, in, in thinking about leveraging technology for doing social good, leveraging technology for uh, both data and technology for um, some of our aspects and sort of having the skill sets or talent within the organization um, to be able to do that, we must think about how that is different from the private sector. So here we do have to value the sort of domain expertise that is needed in terms of solving the particular issue and then have the skill sets that are being developed with regards to that. As an example, if someone's working on climate change and you're thinking about data or tech talent, it's not just important to be looking at data and tech talent uh, that has sort of worked on private sector case studies, but really people who understand what are the challenges with regards to climate emergency and having solved some of those problems to be able to apply those skill sets there. Um, a couple of things that we at data.org are doing with regards to thinking about both how to leverage technology for social good and how to build the skill sets are looking at the intersectionality of uh, both data capacity and some of these uh, fields. So we work at the intersection of climate, health, uh, we're working with organizations on financial inclusion and seeing what data capacities can they uh, build and what, what is it needed. We're also looking at building the capacities at various levels. So we're thinking about capacities not just in the individual level, which is very much required, but also at the organizational level and then the sectoral level. So when you're thinking about these different levels, one is thinking of um, whether an organization is really ready to make that digital transformation or become sort of, is, is it mature enough to get into um, the tech and data world to be able to embrace that. Uh, and this is really important because as we think about accepting more professional talent, more data and tech talent into the sector, more specialized talent, is it really, uh, is, are, are the NGOs of today uh, sort of at that level where they have shown the maturity to be able to integrate them within the organization? Um, an example of this is the data maturity assessment that we have created for organizations as a self-assessment to think about where they are on their data journey. Um, one gets sort of to look at 10 different pillars of data and tech and think about um, our, where they stand with regards to data culture, whether data is one person's job within an organization or is there a buy-in from the leadership to uh, the lowest uh, people in the organization um, and how the organization is thinking about uh, building these capacities in terms of upskilling its own people so that there's at least a basic level of data and tech literacy within the different staff members. Um, all of these things are important as we think about people moving from um, sort of becoming just that specialized, you, you do your own thing and you don't know what's happening around you versus you starting to understand the nuances of um, what, what the issues that you're solving for um, are with regards to applying the data or, or technology that you want to uh, work on. Thank you. And, and, and Shreya, if you'd like to maybe build on that also from the point of view of, um, you had mentioned the need for organizations to start uh, thinking about professionalizing and, and uh, the compliance requirements are also changing. Um, and, and that McKenzie is working with organizations to help them with that. Can you talk a little more about that work? Uh, and, and maybe a second question to you is, um, as, as you've seen others talk, there is obviously innovation requirement at the level of collaboration in the industry as well, right? So, so what's happening there and, and what can we sort of learn from there in terms of collaboration? Yeah, thanks, Kunal. Um, so I think a lot of what, what Priyank said, right, as organizations grow and, and a lot of NGOs start off with a very passionate founder and they do some work and you know as as the work grows the organization grows you know so we talked about thousand crore organizations but then for that you also need a couple of hundred people to run that organization so as you grow the organization gets more complex and you need to start putting in organizational structures and very often um, the you know the management capacity built out is something that 
we don't see people investing it in the nonprofit space, right? It's a lot of let's get more people and, you know, we can pe keep putting more pressure onto them, but we need to also then create the management capacity. And, and at every different level, we see this, right? At CEO level, um, I hear a lot of uh, founders talking about how lonely it is, how they don't have people to discuss their problems with or just share thoughts and brainstorm with. They don't think about things like succession planning, right? Like you, you need to start putting in structures for saying who's going to take up from me. You know, ma'am, I want to retire or move. Those are things that we don't often openly talk about. At mid-management, do we really work with our teams to say, how do you manage conflict? How do you think about incentive structures and rewarding? Sometimes it's like, oh, we've been together from the beginning as part of the journey, so, you know, we'll keep growing, right? But you do have to think about promoting somebody, right? And, and what are those structures? What are some of the systems that you can put around conflict management, right? You're all team members, yes, but you're running a professional organization and you have to solve for conflict. So these are things that we often don't see openly talked about in the nonprofit space. And at McKinsey Center for Social Impact, some of the, the core management skills training that we do with our for-profit clients is things that now we are working with our non-profit partners and we are helping them build out these management skill sets as well because we do realize that the social sector and the non-profit sector is a very integral part of our growth story, right? And until we can help them think through some of these challenges, we are really not going to be able to achieve all the goals that we want to achieve. Um, the other thing that, you know, is also interesting is a little bit more of an introspective look, right? So this is where some of the tools that we have. So these are survey tools which says that can I actually, you know, again, as founders, as people, leaders running organizations, how often do you sit with the person that is maybe implementing on ground and say, you know, what do you think is our vision mission? Where do you think we're headed in five years? So can we again provide survey-based tools that helps you understand your organizational strengths and weaknesses where then you can design based on that your five-year strategy. And this has shown some really interesting results when we've done this with nonprofits where they said, we didn't realize that people on field felt X, Y, Z, right? And it was different from our understanding of where we want to be five years. So again, these are tools that we've uh, unlocked pro bono for the, for the nonprofit sector and we really hope in the next five odd years to help multiple different organizations strengthen their organization structure. Um, the other thing we do through McKinsey Center for Social Impact is also help organizations think through their growth strategies, their vision, mission statements. So this we do through pure consulting programs, right, where we embed teams, uh, work very closely with you over, you know, uh, three to four months, but really help you think about what is your vision, mission, what is your core strengths, where are some of the new markets that maybe you want to enter, maybe just help you think about the design of your organization. Uh, and, and Kunal, you know, you asked how are we seeing new collaborations in the market, right? And this is, this is also interesting because you, sometimes we see organizations stretch themselves very thin and say, you know, we started working in education, in, in primary education, we did well, we got to know the state department, so we also expanded into saying let's do skilling, right? Or we also expanded into saying let's do teacher assessment, and then you stretch yourself thin. So the, the new age collaborations that, you know, we are supporting and we are thinking about is saying, yes, you have, a, you have a strength and core capability, you have a relationship, but then why don't you then build out and invite other people that have the, the assessment strengths, right, or the strengths in uh, teacher, teacher training or the strengths in saying mental health, right, and then put together a collaborative and work collectively in that space rather than trying to uh, you know, play across all the spaces and become an expert across. And, and I think those are some interesting innovations and models we'll see. Sumit is probably seeing some amount of funding around those models as well, where five or six NGOs that work in the same space, so in the same sector, say education, healthcare, et cetera, but across all the different value chain of it come together and say over the, over the next five years, let us collectively work towards the common goal instead of competing for limited resources that exist in the market. Yeah. No, oh, thanks. Thanks so much, Chef. The, the role of collaboratives is extremely important. Thinking through how people can come together, what structure and how do you align incentives is equally important. But I, I see a big red sign over there which says time's up. Uh, so probably can't get into uh, Q&A, but I'll, I'll quickly summarize because I think we've all learned a lot uh, in this session. So thank you so much for the, for the panelists. It's been, it's been insightful for me. I'm sure for, for people sitting in the audience as well. In terms of initiatives, I, I think we heard about um, outcome-based funding, impact bonds uh, as, as a way of disruption, how we're seeing some early success in education and application in other sectors as well. 
Uh, Sumit talked about uh, different flavors of, of, of money, map, mapping different funders to different needs, and there are ways to do that and, and to scale that model. Um, we talked about community-based approaches where there is a need to uh, involve more community, move away from just specialists, but uh, providing the, moving the ownership to the community and then scaling those models. But at the same time, thinking about uh, inclusion and intersectionality uh, and, and keeping in mind that these approaches cannot be blindly ap applied to uh, all different use cases. You need to think about the distribution and the segmentation. Uh, and, and finally, we also heard a lot about internally within organization, the need to think about data capacity and using technology uh, and, and to uh, almost elevate your learnings as an organization, as an expert, to think about how you can collaboratively come together. Uh, so there are these six or seven really good examples of where we started seeing innovation and, and hopefully uh, it's, it's been uh, a useful, insightful session for, for the audience as well. Once again, thank you for the panelists. And I'm glad that we were able to wrap this up in time. Thanks a lot. I would like to convey a special thanks to the moderator and panelists for their valuable con contribution. So now I would like to request